What's up, eco nerdlings? In this podcast, we're going to be discussing saltwater ecosystems. So let's go ahead and get started. So aquatic zones, we discussed those whenever we talked about freshwater. So just like freshwater, oceans too have different zones that are subdivided. And they're subdivided based on the availability of the two largest limiting factors. The two largest limiting factors in our ocean environments are the sunlight and nutrients. So looking at this diagram right here, it gives us insight to the major life zones as well as the vertical zones in an ocean. So right here we have our continental shelf, which includes our estuarine zone where we have our high tide and our low tide. And then right here, this is our euphotic zone. This is the zone in which light penetrates. After that, we have our basal zone. So we have very, very little light penetrating here. And sometimes it's also called the twilight zone. And below that, we have our abyssal zone. No light gets into the abyssal zone. It's completely dark. And once we get here as well, water temperatures drop rapidly between the euphotic zone and the abyssal zone in the area called the thermocline. Thermo is referring to temperature. So first, we're going to discuss the coastal zone. This extends from the high tide mark on land to the edge of the continental shelf. So right here, high tide, and then to the edge of the continental shelf. Make sure you guys know all of these different zones because I guarantee they will be on your exam. So despite only making up about 10% of the ocean's ecosystems, the coastal zone actually accounts for 90% of the biodiversity. And life is very plentiful here due to an abundance of sunlight and nutrients. These, remember, are the two biggest limiting factors of life in the water. So the open sea and the ocean floor host a large variety of different types of species. We have three main vertical zones in the open sea. We have our euphotic zone, which we just talked about. So in our euphotic zone, this is where the sunlight penetrates. So you're going to see a lot of phytoplankton. And remember, phyto means plant, and plankton are little creatures that can float, and they basically just go with the flow of the ocean or the currents, wherever they might be, because they're not strong swimmers. Here, nutrient levels are low, and dissolved oxygen content levels are going to be high. Then we have our basal zone right here. It's very dimly lit, and zooplankton and smaller fishes can be found here. So last, we have our abyssal zone. This is going to be very, very dark and cold. You don't want to go there. The pressure is also extremely, extremely high there because it's found very, very deep within the ocean. They have high levels of nutrients here. They have very little dissolved oxygen content, and you're going to find a lot of deposit feeders and filter feeders that live here. We also have upwellings that bring nutrients to the euphotic zone from that zone. So within the coastal zone, we also have estuaries. These are partially enclosed bodies of water where seawater mixes with fresh water. And there are also varieties of coastal wetlands. These are areas of land that are fully saturated with water at least part of the year. These include our salt marshes, seagrass beds, and mangrove forests. So right here, you have a picture of a salt marsh. This is a coastal wetland that is regularly flooded by tides, and it's dominated by herbs, grasses, and shrubs. Typically in a salt marsh, you don't really see a lot of trees in the area. So right here would be the salt marsh with all of the salt marsh grasses going on right here. So we also have seagrass beds. These are wetlands with plants that have long, narrow leaves that grow to resemble grasslands. Next, we have mangrove swamps. These are wetlands with trees that have evolved to survive very high salt and very low oxygen water levels. So a lot of the mangroves you're going to hear about are going to be from Florida. So you hear a lot about the mangrove forests in Florida. So this is what these guys are right here. The mangrove trees that are very well adapted to high salt concentrations and low oxygen concentrations in the water. So what are some of the benefits of wetlands? Why do we need them? Well, wetlands are very highly productive in ecosystems, and they support a great deal of biodiversity. They can slow and hold influxes of water, and it helps to prevent flooding. So water that passes through the wetlands also tends to come out much cleaner, so it's kind of a natural filtration system. And it has less sediment and pollution in it as well. 
So going back to our original case study that we started when we began talking about aquatic ecosystems, New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina. So as New Orleans City grew, open land was in short supply. So of course we did what all humans do. To solve the problem, we basically wiped out coastal wetlands. Uh, they were drained and we started building the city upon them. So the remaining wetlands basically disappeared due to the loss of river sediment that sustained them. So the loss of the coastal wetlands left New Orleans nearly defenseless when Hurricane Katrina hit. And when Hurricane Katrina hit, almost every single levee that we built was breached, meaning that the tides went over the levees and flooded the entire town. And if you remember, New Orleans is basically in a bowl because it has been sinking slowly. So all of the waters came in and it oversaturated the ground, so the flooding was horrible. However, reconstruction has taken place and they've been putting a lot of different types of things into plans in order for this not to happen again in the future. So in 2012, which was seven years after, a plan was finalized to protect the area from future storms. Barrier islands were rebuilt. The inland wetlands will also be restored. So gates will be installed into the levees along the river to allow water as well as sediment to flow over the wetlands. That way the sediment helps to build that up. And we're hoping that by the year 2042, the state should actually begin gaining more land than it actually loses. So next we're going to discuss the intertidal zone. The gravitational pull of the moon and the sun causes the tides to rise and fall about every six hours on the coasts, and that's going to be our intertidal zone. This creates an intertidal zone that's submerged during high tide and it's exposed during low tide. So the different types of animals and plants that live in this area have to be adapted to both the water environment as well as the open uh, air. So you'll see a lot of plants that have really strong hold fast that hold onto rocks so whenever the water's coming in or out, they're basically going to flow. They're also gonna have very flexible stems. You're not really gonna see many fish living here. You're gonna see a lot of crustaceans. You might see starfish, sea urchins, uh, different types of hermit crabs are going to be living in this area as well. And then the physical nature of the shores and the intertidal zones can vary very greatly. So we have rocky shores. These are found on coasts with heavy wave action. So smashing into the uh, rock. So like when I went to New Zealand this past uh, summer, I saw a lot of rocky beaches and the waves there were very, very strong crashing into the shoreline. Sandy shores are found in areas with gentler wave action that are sheltered, such as in the Gulf of Mexico, including the Galveston area as well as Florida. You're going to see a lot more sandy beaches than you are rocky beaches. The color of the sand actually indicates the source material that it eroded from. So if it's black, it's going to have eroded from volcanic ash. If it's brown, it's going to have eroded from granite. And if it's white, it's actually going to be eroded from coral. So next we're going to be discussing coral reefs. The coral reef ecosystems are beautiful and amazing and full of life. But unfortunately, a lot of them are starting to be ruined and die off due to coral bleaching. So coral polyps, these are the small little critters that live in the warm coastal waters of the tropics and subtropics. They form a mutualistic symbiotic relationship with a photosynthetic algae. As those polyps grow, they produce a calcium-based external skeleton, and when the polyp dies, the skeletons are left behind, and those are what form the reef. So after they die, those skeletons keep building and building and building, and you get this beautiful reef that forms. So over time, the network of all those crevices and ledges creates the actual coral reef, which is an ideal habitat for a very large variety of fish, as well as other marine animals. This is the most diverse and productive ecosystem in the entire ocean. So coral reefs, we have ecological as well as economic services that are involved with the coral reef ecosystems. They're very important. So they help us to moderate atmospheric temperatures, and they also act as natural barriers protecting coasts from erosion. They provide habitats for thousands upon thousands of different species of fish and animals and plants. And they also support fishing and tourism businesses for the people that live around them. They provide many jobs as well as building materials for humans as well. And many people just like to study them 
or go on vacation and enjoy snorkeling around the reef. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, we're having a lot of reef degradation. Uh, the number of coral reefs around the world are starting to drastically decline. So the coastal uh, development is causing a lot of the reefs to be destroyed so we can develop out the coast. We have pollution that's occurring, overfishing that's occurring, as well as warmer ocean temperatures leading to the coral bleaching. When the temperature gets too warm, it kills off the algae and the polyps. And then the increasing ocean acidity is also causing this to occur. So next we have our open ocean. So moving away from the coast, the availability of nutrients drastically decreases. The nutrients become a limiting factor for life here. And a lot of times the open ocean is actually referred to as a marine desert because there's a huge lack of nutrients and animals that live here have to be able to travel large distances in order to find food. So the characteristics of the water in the open ocean change as you move downwards. So like we talked about earlier, we have our photic zone, which contains sufficient sunlight for photosynthesis. So up here would be our photic zone. Then we have our aphotic zone. Remember a means without and photic is talking about light. This can also be referred to as the basal zone right here or twilight. It's gonna receive a very, very small amount of light. And then we have our benthic zone, which is also referred to as our abyssal zone. This is the ocean floor and no sunlight reaches here. It's extremely, extremely cold. And we also have great pressure that occurs there as well. So food webs in the benthic zone or the bottom of the ocean are very different because their source of energy doesn't actually come from the sun, but it comes from dead matter that basically snows down from above. And it's actually called marine snow. So another adaptation that a lot of animals have whenever they're living in the very, very deep ocean where there's no natural light is they actually bioluminesce. So this right here is a tinafore that's bioluminescing way down in the ocean, wherever the sunlight can't actually reach it. So they actually have naturally occurring chemicals within their bodies that bioluminesce. Another animal that lives down there that a lot of people hear about is the deep sea anglerfish. Those are little guys that have that crazy little lure on the top of their head and it bioluminesces so it's kind of like up there bioluminescing and some poor little fish comes along to try and you know take a little bite because it thinks it's probably a little tina for something like that and then all of a sudden wrong bam big anglerfish kind of eats it so one of the creepy little things that lives in the uh, dark ocean that's something that i remember when i was a little kid and i was learning about all the deep ocean stuff i saw a picture of that thing and it gave me nightmares so uh, but anyways, that was uh, my little talk about bioluminescence and the little bioluminescent lure, uh, one of the adaptations that deep sea creatures have. Well, I hope that was helpful for you guys. If you need to review this video or find any other videos about AP Environmental Science, you can do so at my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing out. Stay nerdy until next time.